Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're going to take a look at Cresco Labs Pitch Deck and give our seven tips to a successful investment deck. To help us do that is Katrina Glogowski, angel investor and attorney. Katrina, thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. All right, seven tips to a successful investment deck. Number one being, will Cresco Labs identify the business plan goals? Number two, do they know their audience? Number three, are they going to understand the market? Number four, will they identify needs and roadblocks? Number five, do they know what sets the business apart? Six, will they introduce the team and products? And number seven, will they create a summary with a call to action? Let's find out. All right, so looking into Cresco Labs pitch deck. All right, got it here finally. Disclaimer, some updates. Looking at um, Illinois' uh, total addressable market, maybe 1.2 million in daily sales for the first two months, 24% out of state buyers and 25% market share at the end of 2019. That's not too bad, early mover advantages. Absolutely. And we are seeing Illinois pulling in, I think, over a hundred, a um, hundred dollars on average, about one hundred ten dollars per person per visit. Uh, so they're definitely pulling in some serious cash, over a billion dollars in in sales last year. Um, same with um, Colorado and even Oregon, and then of course California, like three point eight billion. But I digress. All right, so cultivation footprint forty thousand square feet. 215,000 square feet of cultivation as of the second quarter 2020 and a potential canopy size of 630,000 square feet, which I think is our neighbors to the north have maybe found out that that's maybe too much for one state. Maybe. Uh, if that is their actual facility, Josh, that is quite large. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, that's, that's six Costco's. <laughs> Costco should have cannabis, by the way. <laughs> so in Illinois, they've got five operating stores, 10 retail licenses, and 117,000 transactions. Um, so not too bad. I think that may be just like one store out there with all of that. Five yeah. stores, but yeah, one city, I guess. All right. Origin House Integration. So they effectively merged their sales force. They branded... Um, and then leverage their top tier operators and optimize costs uh, out in California. So they've got uh, continuum product testing, Cresco Labs cultivation, uh, Floracal Farms cultivation, uh, fulfillment also by continuum, processing also by Cresco Labs. And yeah, it's not bad. They got a nice footprint in California. Huge market. Other updates with Massachusetts, they closed an acquisition for Hope Heal Health uh, back in February uh, of last year. Added two additional dispensaries. And then in New York, they converted all of their dispensaries to the Sunnyside Retail brand, launched a medical delivery program. Um, in Nevada and New Mexico, they're awaiting state regulatory approval. And then Pennsylvania, they continue to have the largest market share there, one of the fastest growing medical markets and fifth largest state with the sixth largest city in Pennsylvania. They, they're growing their MSO. Slide 10 shows us a corporate snapshot, one of the largest vertically integrated multi-state operators Number two in the market for capitalization. So they were founded in 2013. They're across 11 states. They have 133 million in addressable market uh, with 18 production facilities and, and 1.2 million square feet for footage for cultivation. You know, the, according to this chart, they're second only to Cura Leaf, uh, making them bigger than Acreage, Harvest, and MedMen. Uh, I knew they were a player, but uh, this is an educational graph because I didn't know that they were that big, Josh. Yeah, also in front of Ianthus, um, you know, True Leaf and, and Green Thumb Industries, so pretty big. Yeah. Some of their team comes from some Fortune 500 
companies like Johnson Johnson, Ford, PepsiCo, Starbucks, Pfizer, Walgreens, all of that. So um, when I see a team like that from that kind of corporate conglomeration, I think exit strategy right off the bat, they're trying to build something that's uh, recognizable to their previous um, corporate peers, trying to build up this thing for, for an exit strategy. Building it right. One of the most strategic footprints in the U.S., according to them, <laughs> they've got 41% of the United States population, uh, maybe two thirds addressable market share, maybe. Well, they have population centers. So I think that's where they're getting th those, uh, those numbers. So their vertical, Cresco Labs Advantage, they have vertical integration. So it definitely does help when you can control everything from seed to sale and all of the branding and pricing and everything in between. So they cultivate and manufacture, they produce brands, they have wholesale distribution and they own the retail. Right, that wholesale distribution doesn't apply to every state though. Um, uh, I think they're focusing primarily with that comment on California, which has a wholesale distribution model. So um, that, that's interesting. Here's the reasons why vertical integration is going to win. So uh, EBIT margin, consumer verticals, they have brands that are delivering higher margins. Um, they compare it to apparel and beverages and tobacco uh, as well as their competitors. This, this is good, uh, but this is in the context of vertical integration and con uh, controlling their cost of goods sold, uh, which I always like to see because you and I, Josh, talk about cost of goods sold continuously. You got to drive it down. Uh, I'd be very surprised if that, if that number of their cost of goods sold really is 35%. Uh, if they have a 65% margin, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, amazing, especially compared to their competitors. Pureleaf, the largest, only has a 25% margin. So or, that, that's interesting. Or MedMen that just had to take out $10 million, they have a 5% margin. And we're comparing that to traditional um, consumer products like tobacco that has 40 beverages at 30 uh, down to apparel at 14. Yeah. So they have a brand portfolio, some of their products, vape, flower, pre-rolls, concentrates, all of that. Um, and then here's some issues potentially with the FDA as they kind of brand this as rest, relax, rebalance, rekindle, recover. We'll see how long they're able to, to keep that in play. Yeah, that's their CBD line, yeah. Interesting. FDA is cracking down on that. Um, so James Beard award-winning chef Mindy Siegel unleashes her culinary craft to take cannabis confections from edibles to incredibles. So. Uh, you know, following suit with their their Canadian counterparts with um, Snoop Dogg and uh, Seth uh, Rogan and um, what's her name? <laughs> Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart, yeah. Yeah. So they've got some, she's got some infused candies, it looks like. Um, they're highlighting some Vaporizers also labeled as relaxing. All right. Just more images of looks like private private labeling, a high or maybe that's just their their low budget, high supply. Actually, I like right. this packaging. Uh, nice and simple, not busy. It, 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 I think the assumption that this is their uh, this is their budget brand, uh, but it still looks pretty nice for, for a budget brand, honestly. So, I mean, until they can get beverages down to 10, 15 cents a milligram, it's not going to be an everyday thing. And until cannabis kind of follows suit with tobacco at $20 a pound, it's, you know, not going to be an everyday thing, but I, I do like this shake, you know, seven grams of shake in this jar. You just pull it out, roll your own pre-roll if you want. And as I'm in the store getting some, um, 
some uh, cones, whatever to fill my own stuff with. I looked over and saw a package, a one pound package of tobacco for under 20 bucks. I'm like, that's going to be nice when that happens. <laughs> you yeah. can buy bulk for really cheap. And I think people should count on that happening, you know, within the decade. But moving on to delivering superior growth, they have top line growth and improving margins and capital agenda, including a strategic M&A, disciplined capital allocation, increasing cultivation capacity, uh, all trying to get superior returns on invested capital. I, I like that they have indicated that the SOPs are going to drive their margin improvement. Uh, because first of all, that's true. But second of all, uh, very few pitch decks do we see even mention SOPs. So they get a point for me on that one. Can we give them a bonus point on the chart? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's, that's an important thing to, to note too, because if, if you have um, procedures where you have people taking cannabis from a dry room 15 minutes to another facility, like that time adds up, right? So you kind of really want to have standard operating procedures that really uh, define and make things a lot more efficient and effective for everybody involved. Yeah, agreed. Financial corporate event summary. Um, Looks like they closed some acquisitions like Valley Agriceuticals, terminated the acquisition of VitaCan, a sale leaseback option for $50 million for an Illinois facility. Mm. Yeah, closed an acquisition for Hope Heal Health. They closed another $100 million secured note for credit facility. So yeah, rolling. they were rolling last year. Again, this uh, pitch deck is about a year old, but kind of gives us a good idea of what they were trying to do and uh, what they were able to accomplish. And so that looks like that's about it. Um, mm. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the seven tips to a successful investment deck. Um, number one, did they identify the business plan goals? I think they had one chart that said, uh, this is where we want to grow. Uh, so uh, I assume that the funding would be um, um, funneled into that chart, Josh. So, yeah. Yeah, they weren't very clear about it, but assuming that the multi-state operator wants to continue to have multiple states, that's what I would assume that their goal is. Right. Uh, all right, what about uh, knowing the audience? I think they knew the investor audience fairly well. They were using catchphrases and buzzwords that investors like to see. Uh, they, they included some financial information uh, as far as um, their margins and how they're going to drive down the margins even further. So uh, uh, I do think they knew the investor audience. And as far as the cannabis audience, uh, they did talk a little bit about their competitors. So I'm going to give them a point there. Awesome. And then, all right, so we got a point for identifying business plan goals, knowing the investor audience, understanding the market. What about identifying needs and roadblocks? This one... I think they, they were a little softer on. Um, they didn't talk about anything related to hiccups in regulation, legislation. Uh, they didn't really identify any possible uh, way that could slow them down. Uh, and so I, I really, I really concern, have concerns about that because lots of things can slow them down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't mention FDA. They didn't mention um, timing on U.S. legalization or any roadblocks or any information. Uh, all right, we'll give them zero for that. Mm -hmm. Number five, knowing what sets the business apart. What's their secret sauce? I think their secret sauce, Josh, as identified by this pitch deck, is, is controlling their margins. Uh, they spend a lot of time in the pitch deck uh, talking about their competition uh, what their competition's margins are and how they get to that margin. So I, I, do, I do think that they get a point for number five. Uh, typically we see in the pitch deck, 
uh, at this stage, um, entrepreneurs will say, I'm different than my competition in this way. You know, we have a different type of product. Uh, but here, uh, Cresco focused as their differentiator, the financials. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is very, very important. So yes, they get a point for number five. I agree. All right, number six, introducing the team and products. We definitely saw a lot of products, but we didn't see any of the team members. This just annoys me, Josh. Uh, they are a publicly traded company. So this is public information who your teams are. Uh, they, did, they did say, hey, our teams have experience from these areas but they didn't identify the CEO, they didn't identify anybody uh, and, and it's a failure. Uh, so even though if th they did identify their product, uh, just because they should have known better, uh, I, I'm not gonna give them anything for number six. Uh, at this point, you need to identify your team, especially when you're a publicly traded company Everybody knows who your team is anyway. It's not a secret who, who's on your team. Um, it, it's just a failure. Yeah, MedMen was kind of crumbling this time last year when this deck was put out. So to not differentiate yourself from them, I think is a missed opportunity. Number seven, creating a summary with a call to action. Uh, with the statement that they are a publicly traded company and, and we talk about the... Uh, the things that uh, make uh, publicly traded companies different. Uh, there was no ask, there was no raise, uh, but that is forgivable because they are a publicly traded company. Uh, and, and so I do think they created a summary in the patchwork effect of we want to grow and we need money to grow. Uh, but there was no call to action done. Okay. All in all, we're going to give them four and a half out of seven. We'll call that 64%. Not too bad. Not, there were a lot of things I liked about this pitch deck. Uh, I liked how granular they got in disclosing their margins with their competition margins. Uh, we very rarely see that. I'm very happy about that. And also their focus on SOPs to drive those margins, which we, I don't think to date have ever seen. So there was a lot to like about this pitch deck, Josh. I don't think there was anybody necessarily that was involved that got me really interested. Um, you know, so again, the thing that I would look at is the financials and see if they speak for themselves, because obviously the team members weren't uh, enough to to look at. Um, they are publicly traded up in Canada and on the OTC in, in the US. Uh, I'm not sure if they're DTC eligible. Uh, their ticker symbol is five digits ending in F. So maybe you can't find them at your brokerage firm because they don't, uh, they're not DTC eligible. Anyways, um, yeah, so all in all, um, yeah about 64% interested in this company <laughs> uh, along with the uh, four and a half out of seven Leafs. So that is what it is. All right. I think we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Katrina Glugowski, angel investor and attorney. Thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is the talking hedge. Don't forget to like share and subscribe or don't. And I'm out to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. <laughs>